Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Verily all praise is due to Allah. We seek his aid. We seek his help. We seek his forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil within our own souls. Whosoever Allah guides, there is no one to misguide him. Whosoever Allah leads astray, there is no one to guide upright. I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah alone, and all dominions is his. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam is his last messenger and seal of all the prophets. I want to first of all thank the brother at Ikra for inviting me out here to Australia to meet you, you some beautiful brothers, mashallah. And when I told the brothers I called home to America, I said, man, the brothers out here have some good hearts, man. These brothers are very organized. I told them I did tours around the world, and none of my tours is organized like the brothers out here, man. They got itineraries and everything in advance. I said, man, this, I wish they was my managers in the dunya, in Jahalir. But alhamdulillah, we met in Islam. The brothers at Ikra, man, one of the things I respect about the brothers when they called me and they told me the situation was happening um, in Australia with the Muslim youth, and, and the, the, knowing the age at, of the brothers at Ikra, man, it was amazing to me because it's not too many times where you see the young brothers, you know what I mean, trying to come together, caring about the other brothers, usually because as youngsters, man, we all have shortcomings. Every Muslim has shortcomings, but we always into our own world, man. So when the brothers reached out, man, that's, that shows something special about the brothers, man, and the brothers of Ikra, they really trying to do their best. So in Islam, man, we should all support these brothers. We should all unite. Of, of course, unite upon the Quran and the Sunnah. We ain't saying unite upon nothing else but the Quran and the Sunnah and support the brothers at Ikra, inshallah. The brothers wanted me to touch upon my lifestyle, which inshallah could be beneficial, man, um, to someone. Even though I lived a lot of my lifestyle doing the music and everything, I misled a lot of people. So I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for letting me be able to come down. And um and share with you guys my life story and let them know that I'm through with the music. I'm through with that life. I free myself from that stuff. So on the day of Yama Kiyama, inshallah, I can say, look, well, Allah, is the, he knows everything anyway. But at least the Muslims will know that I freed myself from that lifestyle. I grew up in New Jersey. I had parents that reverted to Islam, African-American father and a Puerto Rican mother. They converted to Islam. And at the age of three, my mother and father, they got murdered in front of me. In the time in America, a lot in Jahalia, we used to have this thing where we say, "This is my Godfather," and this is this some practices we picked up from the Kufa. And unfortunately, it came into the Muslims back then, and because we didn't have the proper um, knowledge of Islam, so the people that killed my mother, father, one of them was my Godfather, and it was a group of these so-called they like gangbangers in America. They called the Nation of Islam, and um. And these are the people that killed my mother and father. So when I was three years old, they got killed. I got shot in my foot. I had a six-month-old brother in the house, and I had a four-year-old four year brother with me. We moved to my, with my grandparents at the time after the murders of my parents to another neighborhood. My grandparents were Christian. And in this household, it was also a couple other cousins around the same age as us. So eventually we started getting into the streets. We started um, getting into the street life because, you know, of course, the grandparents can't control us. We have no parents around. We started fumbling into the street life. At this time, I didn't have Islam, know nothing about Islam. All I knew that I had a mother father who was Muslim. The only thing I know about Islam is we don't eat pork. And this is unfortunate. This is what a lot of the uncles and the fathers back in the day was teaching their kids. Look, we Muslim. We got a book called the Quran. We don't eat pork. So this is the only thing I know about Islam, and unfortunately, I, I strayed away from the religion of Islam. I started going to church. They started trying to force Christianity on me. I started going to church and things like this. But the main thing that happened is we turned to the streets, man. Like I was telling the brothers in America, out here in Australia, the Ikra brothers, that we turned to the streets because when we walked out our doors, it was there. We didn't have nothing else, man. This is what we had. But if we had another way out, we wouldn't be doing the things that we used to do. And unfortunately, when he was telling me what the Muslims and the, young, and the youth that's doing out here today, it seemed like, you know, they got good parents. They even have a front yard sometimes with grass in it. And, and, and we growing up, we didn't have this stuff. So we like, man, these people got these type of parents. They come from a Muslim family. They live in, in, a, in a nice area, and they run into a lifestyle that the people in America, if we had another way out, we wouldn't be running towards that. Like, we running away from that lifestyle. So I wanted to come explain to him um, the situation of the Muslims in America, man, that even the non-Muslims, man, we, we've run it from that lifestyle, man. So when they hear that there's people coming towards that lifestyle and chasing this life, it doesn't make sense to us. Maybe this is a, a trick of the shaitan. 
and he's and he's working his magic, man. But growing up in Irvington, New Jersey, and Newark, New Jersey, I, like I said, I started getting into the streets, which unfortunately a lot of the young people in America, and especially where I was from in New Jersey, they they turn into dealing drugs, they turn into alcohol, especially at a young age because either their parents are dead, like like I was telling the brothers, when I grew up without no parents, it was normal to me. When I go and say I don't have a mother and father, the other people in the neighborhood wasn't like, whoa, you don't have a mother and father? I thought it was normal until so people started reacting when I got older, like, you don't have a mother and father? Oh, man, because growing up in the hood, this is normal, man. When you don't got a mother and father, this and this, okay, so what? Let's go in the play, park and play. Let's go get some candy. This is how the people is in the inner city because this is a normal lifestyle. Majority of the fathers are locked up. Or if they're not on drugs, they're either dead. So this is what happened, especially in the African-American community, until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought Islam to us. That was the only way out of that darkness was Islam. And that's why you got so many people in America, America in generally, just run into the religion of Islam. You know, they run into it head on. And that's the only thing we have out there, alhamdulillah. So basically, when I turned to the streets and everything, and I started doing music. This is the time where I started writing and trying to get into music. And it was a childhood friend of mine named Gaddafi. This was his, his, his rap name. His name was Gaddafi. I ran into Gaddafi after I didn't see him in some time, and I found out that he was a rap. He was rapping, doing music also, and he, his brother was Tupac Shakur. So his mother said, "Look, when Tupac come into New York, I'm gonna introduce you. Boom, boom, boom. Y'all get together. Things like that. Inshallah." So we got together when I met Tupac. I, I already got kicked out of high school, unfortunately, but alhamdulillah, I'm going to go back. So any kids in here, stay in school, man. It's very important. I don't care if you think you're a gangster, you think you're tough, you think you're a thug. It's going to come a time in your life where you're going to wish you would have stayed in school. So stay in school while you're still in school. And uh, alhamdulillah, man, I have to go back and get my GED and get my high school diploma and, you know, take time out. So while you guys are already in school, man, don't, don't stay in school, you know, because... I don't care wherever you go, man. Nobody likes a dummy. You know what I mean? They don't respect people that don't have no knowledge. You don't get a job. They look down on you. Even in the land of the Muslims, man, when I try to do Hijra, I'm thinking, man, maybe I, I left this music. Let me go to the land of the Muslims and get a job. They said, where's your diploma? Where's your paperwork? So paperwork, school, all that stuff talks. So stay in school, man. And, and back to the, the story, I started doing music with Pac. And I moved out of Irvington, New Jersey, North New Jersey, to Atlanta. And then I, I went to Los Angeles, California. When I went to Los Angeles, this was at a time when Tupac signed to a record label called Death Row Records. Now, going to Los Angeles, man, this was a part of my life that changed me because, like I said, I was 16, 17 years old, no mother and father. We just signed record deals to one of the biggest rap labels, rap record commercial labels in the, in, in the world. But... The other part about it, the people who rap record, the rap record that we signed to, the contract, these was gangsters, man. They was bloods. They was criminals. They was thugs. They was killers that got money and got into the music industry with millions. So ain't nothing, nothing worse than people that's from the streets and you give them a bunch of, bunch of money. You know what I mean? That make it even worse than the street. So we signed, to, we signed to this record label, man. And like we said, you can imagine the things that we got into. Um... You know, some stuff I don't want to repeat for the kids because I don't even want them to think it's okay to even, you know, to do some of these things. But we got into a lot of crazy things. And that, and it took the life of Tupac Shakur, this lifestyle of rapping and the music and then all this stuff. At the age of 25, Tupac got killed in Las Vegas. So this was a point when Tupac died. I said, look, man, everybody that I'm getting close to, Tupac was like a big brother, a father figure to me. Now he's no longer. He's died. He got killed. A couple months later... You know, a couple months before Tupac got killed, my grandmother who raised me died. A couple months later after Tupac got killed, I had a brother that committed suicide. Then a couple months after Tupac, my brother got killed, in the same year, Gaddafi, who introduced me to Tupac, got murdered by my cousin. So this was a, a changing point in my life where I said, man, everybody around me is dying. What am I going to do with my life? I'm living, I'm living a lifestyle that I know this is unnatural. So I started searching. I'm starting to search. And from the hikmah of Allah, one day I was in a recording studio. And I was, I was like intoxicated. I was messed up, and I got into a fight with my little brother. And this was a time where I was so angry, man. I used to have so much anger in me when I went outside, and I'm punching the car windows and this and this. Nobody would dare to try to break it up. And alhamdulillah, man, it was a Muslim that happened to be in the parking lot. I didn't know this guy from nowhere. He walked up to me, and he had good character, mashallah. He was smiling. He said, what's your name? What is wrong with you? Why is you doing this? Instead of him just grabbing me, stop what you're doing, yelling at me, he used hikmah. He calmed me down, so next thing I know, I'm having a conversation with this, this stranger. And usually in America, when a stranger walk up to you, you like you go, you know to go the other way, because you like, man, this guy, he's he crazy. 